will start with this across the pond in the United Kingdom this weekend. Unbeaten up and comer from Wales, Lauren Price will make her bid to see herself crowned a full fledged world champion for the first time opposite the ring. Chicago's own Jessica McCaskill, the still reigning WBA champion. Both the WBA and IBO titles will be on the line. Scheduled for 10 rounds in the women's welterweight division. Where Natasha Jonas still reigns as that division's IBF champion. Ivana Habazin is the newly crowned WBC champion. And of course, Sandy Ryan. The very angry, the very spiteful Sandy Ryan. She reigns as WBO champion. Lauren Price seeks to be ranked as a champion as one among them, sporting a professional record of six wins with no losses, no draws, one knockout, one recorded knockout. Is she ready for this? Jessica McCaskill. Jessica sports professional record of 12 wins with three losses, one draw, five knockouts, having never been knocked out in 16 professional bouts, the more experienced fighter of the two. Having campaigned as low as 135, reigned as a unified champion at 140, and an undisputed champion at 147, with only one title, one title remaining now. She's been in there with some really good fighters. Katie Taylor. Ana E. Esther Sanchez, former champion. Erica Farias. Yeah. Cecilia Breakhouse. Chantel Cameron. Sandy Ryan. She's been in there with a lot of different kinds of fighters. Finesse fighters, hard punches. She's never been stopped. I don't think there's much chance that Lauren Price stops her, but I do think Lauren Price beats her. I do think that. I think that, unfortunately for Jessica McCaskill, she is nearing the end, the end of the road and the end of her career. She's 10 years older than Lauren Price. Lauren is 29, whereas Jessica's 39. Getting up there in age. She hasn't been looking good the last two years or so. A lopsided decision loss to Chantel Cameron and what should have been a loss to Sandy Ryan. Somebody decided to throw Jessica a lifeline. They scored it a draw. But she should have lost. I think she's going to this weekend. I think Jessica is going to lose a points decision to the naturally bigger, 10 years younger Lauren Price, a well-schooled amateur, an Olympic gold medalist, a finesse fighter. Not big on power. But big on speed, big on movement and athleticism. Very fast hands, very fast feet. She fought four times last year, so she's about as sharp as she's gonna be. Having last seen action in December of last year, this will be her first fight in this one. And I think she's ready because coupled with her style, her finesse fighting style and all that movement, all that speed, and the natural size advantage that she has over Jessica, that she is a naturally bigger woman, very fleet of foot. I think the aesthetic of this fight is going to look like the aesthetic of the Taylor fight, the Katie Taylor versus Jessica McCaskill fight many years ago, where Katie was moving around Jessica and boxing her. Boxing her up. Sticking and moving. I think Price versus McCaskill is going to look like Taylor versus McCaskill, except that many years have passed and Jessica is slowing down. She's getting older. Jessica's aggressive style of fighting, what you see is what you get. She's going to barrel forward, throwing big looping shots, big looping punches that I'm fairly confident Lauren will be able to work around, that she can fight a welterweight version of the fight that Katie Taylor fought years ago at lightweight. Lauren's going to do that this weekend. She's got the speed. She's got the movement. Same as Katie Taylor had, with more size. But you can liken it to, or Dimitri Bivol's fight with their, uh, Joe Smith Jr. many years ago. Something like that. You know, one fight is a cerebral fighter, a boxer, a finesse fighter, and the other fight is a banger, but the banger is far too simple. Too crude. Not creative enough with their offense, though still very offensively minded. Lauren Price on points. Lauren Price over 10 rounds is the pick. The price, as they say, the price is right. What Lauren might look to do after that is square off against the winner of Natasha Jonas versus Michaela Mayer. I think Lauren getting the winner of that fight all depends on who the winner is. If it's Michaela, I can see the fight happening. But if it's Natasha, not so much. For the IBF title, there is also Croatia's own newly crowned WBC champion, Ivana Habazin. That is someone else that Lauren Price might consider, assuming someone else doesn't get to her first. And of course, Matchroom Zone Sandy Ryan. The least likely fight to happen because they're on different sides of the street. Ben Shalom is not going to let Lauren Price go over to Matchroom. And while Matchroom might let Sandy go over to Boxer, 
Who says Boxer wants her to come over? They might not. That's a dangerous fight for Lauren Price at only 6, 7, and 0. Oh, so soon in her career, even with a world title, I think they'd hold off on making that fight. Cross that bridge when we get to it. For now, I think Lauren is going to win this weekend. I think she's going to become the WBA and IBO welterweight champion by outpointing Jessica McCaskill. In men's super bantamweight news, some post-fight comments from reigning undisputed super bantamweight champion Naoya Inoue on being knocked down for the first time in his career by Luis Neri. It was a good fight that I was satisfied with, including the knockdown. It was my first knockdown, and rather than being disappointed, the incident itself made me excited, and I had a lot of fun. I didn't see a fighter who was hurt. That looked more like a flash knockdown because his eyes were clear, and when he got up, his legs were steady. If you look at the aesthetic of the rest of the fight, it was a fairly easy fight for Naoya Inoue from round two into round six when he stopped Luis Neri. So it seems to me that that knockdown in the first was a wake-up call. Maybe he wasn't taking him seriously at first. Or maybe he was too eager to make a statement, finish him early, too far on the inside that he got caught with that short left hook and hit the deck. But as soon as he switched on, it was game over for Luis Neri. Beat the hell out of that guy. But don't tell the Americans that. The stupid Americans, like a kid that goes by the name Art Man Boxing. Yeah, he needs to stay in noodle weight and far away from Gervonta. Well, he's already pretty far away from Gervonta. He's at 122. Gervonta's up there at 135. What's that? Three, four weight classes? You matching Gervonta against a guy who campaigns three or four weight classes below him? Why don't you have that energy for Gervonta to fight people in his own weight class? The good ones, not the nobodies like Frank Martin. Because Gervonta's a fucking coward. And so are his fans. Another Twitter user that goes by the name Boxing Pro says, imagine if Tank landed a shot like that. I don't think he knew he is getting back up. That same logic could be applied to Tank. Imagine if Terrence Crawford landed a shot like that on Tank. You want now Yainoa to basically move up three or four divisions. Let's move Javante Davis up three or four divisions. Why don't you fight Terrence Crawford at 147 or 154? Let him go upside your head and see if you don't hit the deck that you're so worried about a super bantamweight. What do these two guys have in common? What, the funny looking art man kid and Post Malone? Uh, they both picked Errol Spence to beat Terrence Crawford. Oh! They're those kinds of boxing fans. Seem to talk more about Javante Davis, a lightweight, taking on a super bantamweight many, many divisions below him instead of Javante cleaning out his own weight class, his own division. There's ample competition there and ample world titles to pick up, but they're more focused on Javante fighting someone who's a lot smaller than he is. And it's not just them. A Twitter user that goes by the name Hans Themistote, who does some writing for BoxingScene.com, said Tim Bradley makes zero sense. He said that he puts Inouye up there with Roy Jones, Crawford, and Sugar Ray Leonard, but he also said that he knew he isn't an all-time great yet. Oh, really? Makes zero sense, to which another Twitter user that goes by the name Adrian replied, I believe he's talking about the talent level, the legacy, is not there yet. Oh, really? You don't think that being a four-division, two-time undisputed champion that just got 55,000 people to watch a couple of super bantamweights fight, you don't think that's a legacy? You can't talk boxing with Americans anymore. I'm telling you, you can't. They are, by and large, the dumbest fucking fan base in all of boxing. Now, it used to be that foreign fighters would come to America for all the opportunities. But opportunities are scarce now. The American market doesn't pay out as much as it used to. And since it doesn't, there's no reason to subject yourself to the stupidity of these people. An American fighter who could fill a stadium with upwards of 50 to 55,000 people would never fight abroad just for the sake of fighting abroad. Because that's what the conversation has become when it comes to Inui, that he should come here. But an American fighter who could fill a stadium here would never fight over there. So why should a fighter who can fill out a stadium over there come over here? To fight who? Japan is in a third world country, you know. Their economy is pretty good and their money's pretty good. Their fans. Their boxing scene. That what you want is for Inui to abandon them to come here to look at you and your fucking face. For what? You have a good number of homegrown American fighters that you don't support. Don't support with your patronage, with your dollars. You don't support them, but you're gonna support him? You know you're not. When you ask him to come over here, it's not because you actually want 
want him to come over here. It's just the only criticism you can come up with because you really can't talk down his legacy. He's a four division, two time undisputed champion that's more active than your average American fighter. He's making a lot more money than your average American fighter. With the difference being that he's a super bantamweight. He's a 122 pounder. It's not at all customary for 122 pounders to make the kind of money that he knew he makes. He makes that possible with his performances and his fans. You just don't like that he doesn't have to come here and kiss your ass. But why should he? There are fighters right here, homegrown fighters, that you bums don't support. Can the Charlo brothers fill out a stadium? In America, can Demetrius Andre? What about Jaron Ennis? You guys have spent enough time online talking up Jaron Ennis. If you put that Crowley fight in a stadium, a baseball stadium, or a football stadium, do it. Does it sell out? No, because you're a bunch of fucking bums that don't support anything. Contributing the least to the sport whilst complaining the most. These fucking people are useless, but we've been all through that. On the heels of this big win, What's next for Inui? What should he do now? Well, now Ya Inoue's next fight is reportedly possible for Wembley Stadium in London, according to the Japanese media. One option for Inui is an offer from His Excellency Turkey Al Al Sheikh, which may see him on the planned September 20th or 21st UK Riyadh season card headlined by Anthony Joshua. That would be a hell of a show, but that show is supposed to be a Matchroom versus Queensbury show, isn't it? I remember hearing they're planning on doing a second installment of the Matchroom vs. Queensbury tournament in September that would be headlined by Anthony Joshua. If he knew he fights on that show, what, is he representing Queensbury? Top rank? Now who's he gonna fight on that show? Wait a minute, so you don't mind the idea of Inui going to the UK, but you do mind the idea of him coming to the US? Yes. Why? Because the only reason fighters came here in the past was for the opportunities, because back then, this was the preeminent market for the sport. But that's not the situation anymore. The UK is actually a better market for boxing than the American one, so until these bums pay, who cares what you have to say? Your gripes, your criticisms, are only as good as your ability to spend money, and if you're not, fuck off. Don't mince words with these people. I do not advise you to argue with these people. You should shun them, ignore them, point and laugh at their stupidity from a distance. Hey, look at the boxing experts. All of their willful ignorance that I do not feel a fighter of Inui's caliber should subject himself to. No, he should go where he is appreciated. And I'd sooner expect the Brits to appreciate him than the Americans. The Americans don't like fighters that want to fight. They like fighters that argue on Twitter. They rather hear about sparring stories from several years ago than see about making fights years later. Demanding them. Leave the gossip girls in America to all of their gossip, because that's what they like, not fights. And super middleweight, technically light heavyweight news, David Benavidez posted this image to his social media after Canelo's big win over Jaime Munguia saying, ¿Por qué me tienes miedo, Canelo? Translated to English meaning, why are you afraid of me, Canelo? And seems like a weird thing to post on his Instagram stories when there's plenty of video of Canelo Alvarez after the fight calling David into the ring and David chose to stay ringside. He chose to stay. He didn't go up. Now, some are saying that it was because of all the security that was around but Canelo Alvarez, who's inside the ring, he's the one calling him. And we all know that David is a PBC fighter. So ultimately, I feel like if he wanted to get into the ring post-fight, he would have, but he didn't. So who's scared of who? And this comes to us as talks for a potential Canelo Alvarez versus Terence Crawford fight are being floated out there by none other than His Excellency, Mr. Turkey Al Al Sheikh. In truth, I could go for either fight, Canelo versus Benavidez or Canelo versus Crawford. But here's the caveat. I feel like for us to get Canelo versus Benavidez, he's got to make it past Vajdik. Former WBC light heavyweight champion Oleksandr Vajdik, who I talked about in my previous video, he's a bigger guy than the guys that David has grown accustomed to fighting down there at super middleweight. David doesn't seem to have a size advantage, a height advantage over him. He's fighting a full-blown, bona fide light heavyweight. Well, what about Crawford? He's moving up to his fourth weight class and he's fighting Madrimov. He is, but I like Crawford's chances against Madrimov a bit better than I like David's chances against 
Vajdik. I mean, Terence Crawford is a pound-for-pound pound fighter, ranked number one on some lists, number two in others, but he's widely regarded as one of the best fighters in the entire sport. But David, even if you like him, he's not a pound-for-pound pound fighter. He hasn't proven that he's on that level yet. After something like a decade campaigning as a super middleweight, having never unified a title there, much less become undisputed like some other fighters have, how's he gonna compensate for the size advantage that he doesn't have anymore? Because he's not actually bigger or taller. We don't even know that he's stronger than Oleksandr Vojtek. The most he's got working for him is that he is younger. Yeah. So thinking about it, it seems to me that if things go sideways for David against Vajdik, he won't fight Canelo. We don't get that fight, at which point it may become about Canelo versus Crawford, which is just as intriguing a fight for me for different reasons. That Terence Crawford and Canelo Alvarez are eye level to each other, even though they are separated by weight and several weight classes in terms of physical dimensions, height, length, reach their eye level to each other so the question is can terence crawford box around canelo alvarez for 36 minutes because there's not much chance that terence knocks him out canelo's never been knocked out he's never been knocked down across four weight classes so terence's best bet to beat him would have to be via a points decision keeping it long and loose and on the outside beating those feet moving around oh. hypothetically staying out of trouble and out of canelo's striking distance for 36 minutes can he do that or does canelo catch up to him and does he stop him because canelo still is a sizable puncher he would be the most sizable puncher that terence crawford has ever fought the most durable fighter that terence has ever fought the most highly rated fighter that terence has ever fought still is one of the highest rated fighters in the sport today this really is the best versus the best. A fight that captures the imagination because the answer isn't quite clear, while Terence is one of the best fighters I've ever seen. There's a lot working against him here, that he is older, some years older than Canelo, and naturally smaller. Can he take Canelo's power, or can he offset it for the duration of the contest? Canelo's been in there with some really big guys and some really big punchers. How do we know that he doesn't just walk through and walk down Terence Crawford? He might. Thus, the way I see it, I could go for either Canelo versus Benavidez or Canelo versus Crawford. Whichever one they can make is fine by me.